so nice to see many faces I've missed during these long months of not, not being in shul together. Uh, I'm Sheila Siegel, and it's my privilege to chair the, the High Holiday Task Force. Uh, we are the group that uh, represents the congregation and supports the clergy in the planning of this year's uh, High Holiday Services. Um, I want to tell you who's part of the group. Uh, it's a group that's been working very hard uh, in many ways. Uh, they are uh, Virginia Green, Elkin Siegel, Robin Lebo, Terry Soifer, Ivy Weingram, Beth Gartskowitz, Sarah Kahn, Brian Wasserman, Orrin Pollock, our communications coordinator, David Haas, Rabbi Abe, Rabbi Annie, and Rabbi Yosef. And we've been meeting um, since early in the summer, uh, working on you know how how to handle this um, this unprecedented the unprecedented challenges of this upcoming high holiday season. And uh, we met earlier in the summer to share some of our goals and and hear about your concerns. We're here tonight to. Um, to share with you what we've, what we've been working on, what's been put in place, um, uh, the things that we've been doing to, to try to help make this high holiday season actually very familiar in many ways and also uniquely meaningful, we hope. And one of the things that's been put in place is the high, high holidays tune-up uh, that is being offered by Rabbi Annie and Rabbi Yosef every Wednesday night. In the High Holidays tune-up, we learn and relearn uh, with Rabbi Annie and Yo Rabbi Yosef. We learn and relearn uh, High Holiday melodies that uh, can nurture our spirits and help us on our journey of preparing for the High Holidays. Uh, that program began last night. It will take place every Wednesday until Rosh Hashanah. And if you missed the first one last night, um, you're in luck because we're going to begin the town hall this evening with a taste of that experience. So we turn to Rabbi Annie and Rabbi Yosef. Hello, everybody. We're going to begin with a song that we started with last night, which was uh, theme from um, a song that we used as a theme from Neila, so picking up where we left off. <laughs>
Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, and thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, I'm going to start us off by talking about uh, the core service that will be happening in BZBI's sanctuary. And uh, as we move on through the agenda, uh, just to give you a sense, um, after I talk about the core service, uh, Brian Wasserman and David Haas will talk us through some of the technology considerations. Uh, Sheila Siegel is going to talk about the, uh, the handbook that the task force is producing to guide people through what these different high holidays are going to look like this year. Uh, then Rabbi Annie will take us through all of the spiritual opportunities that are going to be happening beyond the core service in the sanctuary. Um, and uh, either Terry Seufer or Ivy Weingram or maybe both are going to walk us through some other community participation elements. Um, and we are going to do kind of a short Q&A uh, at the end of each section. So um, we'll, um, uh, you know, as we do um, kind of each of those blocks, there'll be an opportunity for questions theme by theme. Um, and as we move into talking about the core service, we're going to start with uh, Rabbi Yosef giving us an overview of what music is going to look like these high holidays. Thank you, Rabbi Abe. You might be wondering what the experience of uh, high holiday music is going to be like this year. Um, so there are going to be a variety of uh, styles of music. Um, I guess just to put it out front, we're not going to have the same group singing experience that we're used to. It's not going to be, it's not going to be the same. Even if we're, if each of us, each of you in, in your homes are singing along with us, but we'll do what we can to make it as relational and as much of a shared experience as possible. So first of all, in the sanctuary on the bima will be myself, Rabbi Annie, Rabbi Abe, singing together, and um, along with um, the minion of people in the kahal, which who will be holding um, the role of, together of shlichei tibur of people who are representing everyone back home, and um, have the spirit of of singing together. Um, and in addition to, so Rabbi Aini and Rabbi Abel will be uh, functioning as the uh, Tzibur, as the congregation in responsive singing. Um, additionally, there'll be some songs that we're going to uh, record with multiple voices that can be a background um, when we sing live during the service to give a fuller experience of a group singing. Um, it'll be both live and ex extemporaneous, but when you join in your voice, you'll feel like you're hopefully more of an experience of feeling like singing with a kahal, singing with a collective. And finally, there'll be um, uh, one or more songs that we're going to use video to um, record uh, members of the community singing and so we have a, a visual experience of um, the community and the faces that we know singing together in, in unison. And um, uh, like Sheila said, we have these Wednesday nights, an opportunity to sing together, Slichot, which we'll hear about, an opportunity for us to get in, in tune with one another. Um, just want to again reiterate that it's not going to be the same as it has been, but I do believe that if we are all um, raising our voices in song together from wherever we are, that we can, through the uh, the interwebs, create a shared experience of prayer through song. Thank you, Rabbi Yosef. Um, so I'm going to walk us now through the main aspects of the core service. Um, we've got some time to go. The exact details, page numbers, and things are not worked out yet. Our goal tonight is to share with everyone 
the guiding principles and framework that the High Holidays Task Force has developed um, and give you a sense of what to expect. Um, the biggest thing that uh, I can say is if you were closing your eyes and trying to imagine what this is going to look like and what you pictured is last year's Rosh Hashanah service on TV, it's not going to be that. Um, our goal in doing this has really been to design and build a service for the Zoom format that will capture the essence of Rosh Hashanah, that will provide a meaningful and engaging prayer experience, um, and will work in this kind of a mixed environment in which we have a very small number of people present in the sanctuary to run the service and a very large number of people who are on Zoom. Um, we are holding almost all of the services that we've held in years past. Um, the only exception to that is that the public Yisker that was held on Yom Kippur afternoon uh, will not be happening, and I'll talk about why that is uh, a little bit later. Um, but we will be having a service on Erev Rosh Hashanah. Um, it will not be in Rittenhouse Square. It will not include a concert with a full band and dancing and hundreds of people sitting on the lawn. Um, but there will be a service on Arab Rosh Hashanah um, with a special twist that Rabbi Annie is going to share with us a little bit later. We'll be having services on both mornings of Rosh Hashanah, Kol Nidre, and the full day, all of the services of Yom Kippur. Um, our goal for the Rosh Hashanah morning services is to offer a service that sits somewhere between two and a half and three hours in length. Um, thinking about how to offer a complete davening experience and also be offering something that's going to be manageable and digestible in the format that the vast majority of our congregation is going to be encountering it. Um, Yom Kippur, I would imagine the Yom Kippur morning will run slightly longer than that as it always does and obviously there's going to be separate kinds of timing for the other services on Yom Kippur, um, but through all of that as we continue planning the the guiding idea is to offer the kind of complete prayer experience that uh, we think most people expect from VZBI and to be offering it uh, within a reasonably bounded time frame, so that um, there's just a limit to how long we can do this. Um, with that in mind, the design of the service is uh, built to emphasize broad participation. Um, and so wherever possible, uh, actually, we are going to have parts of the service that are going to be uh, led or, or in a, otherwise facilitated uh, by people who are at home on Zoom. Um, so the leading of the prayers will happen from people who are in the sanctuary. The Torah reading will happen from the sanctuary. Um, but the Haftarot, for example, our Haftarah readers are all going to be at home on the Zoom. And we'll use the, um, the spotlight feature, as you may have noticed a few minutes ago when I started speaking, suddenly my face popped up uh, large on the screen. Um, that was David Haas using the spotlight feature. We can use the spotlight feature so that when we have a Haftarah reader who's reading Haftarah from home, they'll be spotlighted on the Zoom. Um, what this is going to allow us to do is actually create a blended service so that there is interaction between the people who are present in the sanctuary and the people who are home on Zoom um, and I believe give us a feeling of being one community even though we are physically separated. Um, likewise, when we have uh, things like um, prayer for country, prayer for Israel, um, we'll have opportunities for people to read those things from home. Um, and there will be uh, aliyot available for people to take aliyot to the Torah via Zoom. Um, so that while the Torah reader is going to be physically in BZBI's sanctuary, um, the aliyot can be shared broadly throughout the community to people who are engaging with the Zoom from home. Um, who will be in the sanctuary? Um, there are two 
groups of people who are going to be in the sanctuary for the holidays, um, but it's a slightly overlapping group. Uh, those two groups are, uh, we have about a dozen people who have self-identified as um, people for whom the use of electronic devices are outside of their Shabbat and Yom Tov practice, uh, meaning they won't go on Zoom on Shabbat or Yom Tov, uh, and we have made space available in the sanctuary for them. Um, we also obviously will have prayer leaders, Torah readers, uh, people like that in the sanctuary. Now, some of the people who don't use electronics on Yom Tov are people who can help us with reading Torah and leading services. So, um, as I say, there are two overlapping groups of people, uh, but between those two groups of people will be uh, within the guidelines for safe use of space in the sanctuary. Um, and you'll notice that Rabbi Yosef and Rabbi Annie, who live in one household, are going to be on one side of the bima. I'll be on another side of the bima. We will have a third table set up uh, for Torah reading so that all of the people who are participating in services um, will be appropriately socially distanced. Um, what you won't see, because they'll be off camera, are all of the people who are not leading parts of the service will be masked and socially distanced from one another. Uh, we are blessed to have a nice large sanctuary that will provide ample room for people to uh, sit at a safe distance from one another. Um, the shofar, I think, is probably the piece that uh, has come up most often and people have the most concerns about, um, both concerns in terms of being able to hear it because it's Rosh Hashanah and concerns about COVID-19 because it is a large device made for projecting the air coming out of a person's mouth uh, into a large space. Um, so uh, the good news, at least from a logistical perspective, is with Rosh Hashanah falling out on Saturday and Sunday, uh, we anyway would have sounded the shofar only on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So all of the complexities of managing shofar are half of what they would have been in a year where the holidays fell on a weekday. We will have some shofar blowing during the service. Um, in places where the blowing of the shofar is a necessary aesthetic part of the service is going to contribute some uh, value added, some forward momentum to the service. We are not going to have the full hundred blasts of the shofar that we would normally have in the course of a service. Um, likewise, the shofar blowing during the service will be done uh, Zoom from home, from people who are in their homes, uh, who will blow shofar for us over the Zoom. Um, and the reason for that is the, uh, a social distancing reason. The medical professionals who have been advising us felt that it was a risk to have shofar blowing in the sanctuary. Um, and it is, of course, not a risk to have shofar blowers, um, whatever droplets they might be spreading in their own home, they're in their own home anyway. Um, and so the medical advice was that it would be much safer for the shofar blowers to blow shofar in their own home. Um, the complication of this, uh, for those who are familiar with the halakha of shofar on Rosh Hashanah, is that the mitzvah of hearing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah cannot be fulfilled by electronic transmission. Um, and so in order to provide the opportunity for people to fulfill the mitzvah to the fullest extent, uh, we are going to organize for the afternoon of the second day of Rosh Hashanah, some small gatherings in outdoor spaces, um, ideally neighborhood focused, where people can come together, where a shofar blower uh, who will be outside will have a mask on the shofar, um, and visualize this without giggling too much, right? Um, but a cloth mask over the end of the shofar will have the same effect on the shofar that a cloth mask over our faces has for our breathing, which is to um, limit the, the flow of droplets that might be coming out. The, um, our hope, this isn't quite worked out yet, um, but our hope is that we're gonna be able to coordinate this with other synagogues in the area. Um, so, you know, if you're living in Rittenhouse Square or Fairmount, it's highly likely that it will be a BZBI member blowing shofar for you. Uh, if you live, for example, in the Washington Square area, uh, it very well might turn out to be a different congregation that organizes the shofar blowing, um, but the, 
theory that we're working on, um, and I'm hoping to in the next week or two have this worked out with the other rabbis, uh, the theory that we're working on is that the more locations we are able to offer for the city, uh, the fewer people will be gathered in each of those locations, um, and that we'll be able to maintain safe group sizes and safe social distancing. Um, and while you can't fulfill the mitzvah hearing the shofar via electronic transmission, um, if you were standing at the corner of 18th and Walnut and the shofar blower was standing in the center of Rittenhouse Square, you certainly can fulfill the mitzvah hearing it over a large distance like that if you are in the physical space of the shofar blowing. Um, so there'll be a lot of uh, kind of detailed scheduling and information coming out about that. Um, I would encourage you not to expect to get too much scheduling information until about um, about a week before the holiday, um, but uh, we will be getting detailed schedule information to everybody about where and when. Um, and as I said, our hope is to be able to do this in a neighborhood environment so that uh, if you're going out to hear shofar blowing, you won't need to go far. And um, I think it's extremely likely if your home has windows that face Rittenhouse Square, you probably can just open the window and hang out nearby. Um, you know, for others who live in other neighborhoods, you might have to walk down the block. Um, and then the last piece, um, well, I think what I'll do, Rabbi Annie is going to talk a little bit more about Tashlich, um, but while we're on it, because this is a question, ordinarily we would also have Tashlich on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Um, this year we are not going to do that for two reasons. Uh, one is for those of you who have come to Tashlich, um, by the Schuylkill River in the past years, no, it has become quite the large gathering, um, and I don't think any of us want that on our conscience. Um, we also feel like it would be a lot to try to organize and a lot to ask people to go to two separate outdoor events on the same afternoon of Rosh Hashanah when we've already had a service in the morning. Um, the mitzvah of Tashlich can be done any time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and when uh, Rabbi Annie talks about uh, what's going to be happening outside of the core service, she's going to talk in a lot more detail about how we're approaching Tashlich this year. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is guests, because uh, I know that there are some people on the call tonight who have historically arranged guest tickets for friends and family. Um, so there are two uh, there are two options basically for guests. Uh, what we are offering for our membership is the interactive Zoom service where people are going to be taking aliyot and um, having different readings and shofar blowers from home uh, and all of the things that I've described. We are also going to be having a simulcast of that Zoom service on Facebook Live. Um, if you come back to the metaphor I used originally, that Facebook live stream uh, will be much more like watching Rosh Hashanah on TV um, in the sense that it's a one-way stream. You'll be able to see and hear everything that is happening on the Zoom, um, but there won't be any interactivity. We won't be able to see the people who are connecting via Facebook live. Um, that stream on Facebook Live uh, is available free to the entire world. Uh, any Jewish person who wants to daven with us will be able to click that link and follow along the service. Um, for those who want to have a guest at the service, um, we will be making uh, guest device logins available to guests of our members. Um, so this isn't for the general public, this is for the, the sibling, cousin, daughter-in-law of our members um, who want to be able to take part in the interactive, to be able to look on the gallery view as I'm looking at all of you now and see all of the different faces. Um, if you're interested in that, you can reach out to uh, David Haas in our office, uh, who can kind of walk you through the process for that. Um, the other thing uh, in terms of security is that the logins that we're providing to our members are going to be restricted to a single device only. Uh, meaning if you uh, take the email that you get with your high holiday login and you forward it to your college roommate because you really want him to be able to come to shul with you also, and then he logs in, you will not be able to log in. 
Um, I'm raising this because um, I know we have some households where um, either you know someone's abroad or there might be kids away at college or for some reason um, members of your household are physically located in different areas. Um, we are providing complementary additional login links uh, for people um, who have a, a single membership household in the synagogue but um, will not be able to share a device for the holiday. Um, and that's, again, you can let David Haas know if that's something uh, that you uh, need access to for whatever reason you need that. Um, that's what we have uh, to share about the core service. Um, and I'm happy to take questions about the core service now before we move on to our next topics. Um, there should be a raise hand button. Um, I'm not sure I don't get that because I'm a host um, but I think uh, okay so Josh Rosenberg I'm about to invite you to unmute and then if you could tell everyone where you found the button to raise your hand also in case they're having trouble finding it hang on sorry I'm trying to figure out where to go um, the button is in the participants list great uh, thank you what's your question sure my question is ha has the list of people who are invited to be in the sanctuary for services been picked yet? And is it the same people for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur or not? Right, so um, our assumption is that the people who don't use electronic devices on Shabbat and Yom Tov need to be present in the sanctuary for all of the holidays. Um, if that turns out not to be the case, uh, if you're one of those people and you could let me know, it'll just help us adjust spaces. Um, we might need to ask people to take turns if we're running up against our safety cap of how many people we can have, but right now we're not running up against the safety cap. Um, so for people who are not using electronic devices on Yom Tov, um, your seat in the sanctuary will be yours for the entirety of the high holidays. Um, in terms of other people, it's not necessarily the same people. Um, so, for example, we have different Torah readers on Yom Kippur than we have on Rosh Hashanah. Um, so, uh, in that sense, we're kind of filling that in based on the people who know the parts of the service, um, the people who are comfortable leading high holiday services and so on. Um, those people may shift, but right now, um, as I said, right now, it looks like we're able to accommodate all of the people who need space in person. Uh, Terry. I, I, I just wanted to know as a potential Torah reader for the second day of Rosh Hashanah, when the Torah reader assignments will be made. Uh, the second day of Rosh Hashanah has gone to one of the people who requested a non-electronic seat. Okay, for this fine. Year. Thank you. No problem, thank you. Uh, other questions about the core service? Uh, Rena, I see your hand up, if you could unmute. Can you unmute me? Yeah, you're on yeah I hear you, Rena. Okay, great. Uh, in regard to the core service, when can I pick up my Sidor? Uh, David, do we, do we have a date for Moxler pickup? David? Uh, I think he has to unmute. He'll have an yes. answer for us in a moment. I'm, I'm sorry, I had to scroll up through 50 people to find my name and unmute. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the dates for pickup will be the 8th, 9th, and 10th of September. There'll be information going out um, to people uh, with, with, with instructions and the opportunity to schedule a time to come in. Now, how do we schedule it? Uh, that, that will be sent out um, as, we, as we organize ourselves. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, there will also be uh, in that information um, for people who are mobility restricted, um, who might need a home delivery. We do have some volunteers who can help with home delivery for people who are not able to come to BZBI. Um, we are asking if you are physically able to come to BZBI and pick up your Mahzarim that um, you do that so that our volunteers can focus on the people uh, who are are, uh, have restricted mobility to be able to get to the synagogue. Uh, Rena, is that another question? No, an answer. Oh. Uh, we live, we have some neighbors in my building and we can maybe drop, we can bring a shopping cart and drop off some Moxo room to, to neighbors in our building, if you like. Oh, great, thank you so much. That's very helpful. Not a problem. 
Uh, do we have other questions on the core service before we move on? Yeah, Ira. Hi. Um, we'll talk about the chauffeur service. Uh, you have the emails that I sent to you, and I had a wonderful conversation with Sheila uh, this afternoon. Uh, so I'm not I'm not here to re to hash out everything that we we discussed, but it now sounds because we talked about several possibilities, but it seems like you're having this core group that's attending because they won't use electronics, but you want the shofar blown from our homes on Zoom. And of course, those people who are not going to use electronics, I'm sure that 100% of them will be going out to the square later on to hear it live uh, in, in the parks. So my point is, if, if we're accommodating the needs of those individuals who will, will not want to use the uh, electronics, then, and again, one of the options that was presented to me is, uh, uh, you know, sound the chauffeur from my home, and I have some reluctance because of neighbors on both sides and, and above. So, and I, and I haven't tested it and so forth, but I'm wondering if you're suggesting that that's the only way I, I did uh, have a suggestion of have a pre-recorded shofar session to meet the needs of the larger, uh, you know, community. And again, you have the option of the other people uh, who will attend the, the, the shofar blowing in the public spaces. Also, I'll add to the list of uh, people that I identified in my email to you. One more person did come through and say that, that she, uh, one of the female uh, shofar blowers, said she would be happy to do it on the outside, as well as a recorded um, um, chauffeur blowing. So, but we really only have half of our um, roster of chauffeur blowers who are, who are willing to come out to the parks. That's, that's the overall concern that I have for that, for that uh, process that you're trying to develop, like, along with the other congregations in Center City. Yeah, I, I think we'll, I think, you know, again, working with the other congregations will be okay. There are also some people who have not blown shofar in our services in the past, but who have self-identified as people who have the skill and are willing to do it. Um, I think, you know, when you bring up the pre-recording, this is something that the task force spent a lot of time on. Um, and I, I want to share like kind of some of what the discussion was, um, because we talked about the virtues of pre-recording parts or even large parts of the service and playing them back versus um, having things happening in real time. Um, and our, our sense was that for this congregation, um, there's something special, for lack of a better word, about things happening in real time. Um, you know, even if a shofar blowing that's happening on Zoom and a shofar blowing that's happening on a video being screen shared on Zoom uh, might physically look the same. Um, there's something about knowing that it's happening live, um, right? Because we talked about um, the prayer for the country and the prayer for the state of Israel are things that could very easily be pre-recorded and played back with no negative halakhic impact on the service. Um, but what the task force came back to time and again was wherever possible, we want to provide a real time experience, right? You know, what, what we are missing this year is the experience of being together in real time as the holidays are happening. Um, and if we can't physically be together, uh, it was important to the task force that we still preserve that we are physically apart, but experiencing it in time together. Um, and so, you know, and kind of that's a that's a kind of a meta answer to the question of will we pre record things. Um, and I understand, I, I, you know, for someone living in an apartment building, maybe it would not be comfortable to blow shofar in your home. Um, you know, and thank God there was someone in those emails who said they're not comfortable going out to parks, but who I think probably would be happy to blow shofar from his home. So um, I think we'll be able to pull this together. Um, I had hoped that we would be able to have a shofar blowing on the Bima. Um, and the, the, the doctors uh, were really opposed to the idea because of the safety factors. 
even in a room with the kind of air volume that our sanctuary has. Um, do we have other questions? Uh, all right, so I'm going to turn things over to Brian and David, who are going to talk us through some of the technology considerations. Um, thanks, Abe. Um, so this is mostly going to be me describing all the hard work David has been doing. Um, David has been um, doing tremendous work setting up a really um, sort of elaborate uh, camera and video management system in the sanctuary so that the people that are, so that when we are on Zoom, we can have kind of as immersive and, you know, synagogue-like um, experience as possible under these, under these restrictions. And so right now there are going to be three cameras um, in the sanctuary to point at um, sort of each of the different locations on the, um, the BIMA. And there's going to be a, there's a, um, everything has been, is in the process of being wired for uh, direct network access and is, um, there's going to be a screen that can be moved into the sanctuary that I think is currently in the, um, 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 that's currently in the chapel, which will allow the clergy to interact with um, the uh, remote Zoom participants. And so here you see the um, cameras, um, you can see that the sanctuary is still intact, uh, even though we haven't been there for four months. Um, and so that's that screen is currently in the chapel, um, but is going to be but can be moved around depending on where um, you know where people need it to to interact. And so um, during the service, um, David will be controlling um, switching between the cameras and uh, also the Zoom experience. So, um, you know, I think Abe alluded to it earlier that there's this spotlight focus whereby, you know, whatever is happening can be focused on, um, but that can also be overridden. So you will have the option of kind of, you know, passively, you know, enjoying the, the presentation and, you know, you know, or if you want to kind of go into, uh, if you see in the upper right hand corner of your screen, there's a, um, there should be an option to go to, um, gallery view that will let you see everyone at once. Um, so if you want from time to time to be able to look out at your, you know, the rest of us, um, you'll be able to do that also. Um, we are going to be, um, I think, you know, a week or two, it's going to be the, all the connections are going to be set up and um, David and the clergy are going to be doing a certain amount of dry runs and whatnot to kind of test out how it works and make sure like, you know, the cameras point where they're supposed to be and so that people can get, um, you know, can get familiar with like where they need to stand and, you know, lay out tape for, you know, when they're walking down the aisle um, to make sure that they stay in view and generally all the kind of little details that go into having a, um, you know, a predictable video experience. And I, th I think the plan is once they have done that, some test runs without the congregation, we are going to actually use it a few times on Shabbat um, to, to make sure it works and see how people like it. And, um, you know, that will allow, also allow us to um, um, kind of catch any unforeseen issues or glitches or just, you know, things that we didn't think about that people don't like or, or whatnot. Um, and so that's kind of how the, the physical setup is, is going to work. Um, before I answer your questions, there are just two, two little, two small points I want to point out. Um, we are looking for people to help um, run supplemental programming. So I think that we may be doing, um, we're still, decisions are still being made as to whether like we're gonna do um, yoga and whether we're gonna have discussion groups and things like that. But, you know, um, if you have, that may require, um, you know, David is great, but there's just one of him. So, um, you know, if you have basic familiarity with um, Zoom and you're just, you're comfortable, just kind of letting people into a session and, you know, you have basic familiarity with kind of computer office software. Um, you know, we'd really appreciate volunteers that can, um, you know, that can help out with that kind of thing. Um, and as I said, I don't think it, would be, it won't be a huge um, time commitment. Um, and just one last thing, um, we're kind of continually reaching out to people that may not have, um, may not be especially tech savvy and know how to use, need help getting onto the, uh, the Zoom services. 
So just if you know of anyone, you know, in the community or whatever that may, you know, that has, that may need just a little bit of help getting set up or may need someone to just get them over the initial discomfort hump in, in doing these types of things, um, you know, please feel free to, uh, to reach out to us. Um, and um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Right. Um, and one, just one last thing also, um, the computer and online experience is kind of continually getting refined. So if you are on, you know, you're doing the Shabbat services or Minion or something like that, and you have some, something that's working or not working or something you like, or you don't like, feel free to reach out to me or David um, so we can kind of continually uh, refine the process for you. So Mort and Carmi have a question. Oh, sure. Um, I don't know. Can I, I can unmute them. Okay, great. No, they'll, uh, uh, they unmuted and then they muted again. Here we go. Here we go. I, I can't figure out. I'm using my phone. I can't see this. Um, uh, anyway, um, since I'm particularly, uh, sensitive to the sound issue, will the participants in the service be using lapel mics as opposed to the Bema mics? Because as they move around, they'll be farther away from the mic. Um, so the, the answer is that we, we actually will be using the Bema mics. Um, we've tested them and the, the sound is very good. There's a direct feed into the into Zoom. Um, and uh, and people will not necessarily be moving. As, as, as Rabbi Abe mentioned, um, there'll be strict separation on the Bema. Um, and so the people will be standing and we'll be blocking them to make sure that they stand in the, the appropriate spot that both puts them where they should be standing for appropriate picture and microphone, because we won't be moving the cameras during the Antif, uh, but also so that they'll be um, uh, socially distanced from everyone else. Um, and Ira Siegel also has a question. Ah, okay. okay, one other thing that I was discussing with Sheila this afternoon, but I'll uh, address it now to, to Brian. Um, you're having this new system, but to what extent are you going to be able to test the capacity of some 700 plus who will be tuning in? And I say this, you know, in government, we have like one platform for when we have a meeting of 100 or 200 people. We have to go to a different platform for 500. And when you get above it, you know, there, there's always breakdowns. So you, you, it will be very frustrating for a large, perhaps a large number of congregants who were uh, not able to adapt and you know, would have to exit Zoom and get back on and, and so forth. How are we going to be able to test it for, you know, we, we, I'll just throw out a suggestion. Maybe one week before we want to have a test, you know, with as many congregants as possible to see if they can receive the feed and, and the sound quality is good. For, for example, not, not to give criticism to uh, Moore who just spoke before, but there was static on his line. And you're going to have a variation of uh, bandwidth capabilities through, throughout the congregation. So I'll turn it over to you folks. How are you going to address that? Uh, so the, the question is a good one. And we've actually had some situations um, in the past where uh, the load on the Zoom network is such because, for example, on a Sunday morning, there are so many churches that are online that the quality of the, of the feed is degraded somewhat. Um, so there, there are two answers to the question. One is that from our perspective, we have uh, backups to make sure that the sound quality is good. Um, if there's any problem with our network, um, our, our, our wired network in the sanctuary, for example, we have the wireless network as a backup. Um, there's not a lot we can do if there's a problem with the Zoom network. So our backup there is to move people to Facebook Live if there is some sort of massive breakdown. Um, but we've, we've already run programs with 150 or so people, um, and we haven't had any problem at all. 
Um, so we're not expecting, I mean, the, the Zoom network can handle a thousand people um, uh, at a shot um, on, on the kind of uh, um, system that we've been using so far. So I, I think we're good. There will naturally be some issues. Uh, but as again, as Rabbi Abe mentioned, we're going for for honesty and 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 a live feel. Um, and so I think at least uh, the task force we've accepted that from time to time there may be some issues. I think it's, Just I think it's worth adding also um, that because we know that you know Hafta Road and some shofar blowing and and various readings are going to be done from home. Um, David is reaching out to those people as those assignments are confirmed to um, do a run through and make sure that people know, um, right, like how to sit so that they're framed clearly um, to make sure that they have the right audio and we're prepared if need be to help people with upgrading audio or cameras or things like that. So, um, you know, for the people that we know are going to be participating actively facilitating parts of the service from home. Um, we're also working with them to make sure ahead of time that um, that those are all set up. Um, and, you know, the reality is um, it is possible that things are going to glitch, uh, but I really want to commend uh, David and Brian and the whole technology uh, team from the task force. Um, they've really left no stone unturned in terms of thinking through uh, not only the technical aspects, but also the, ac the accessibility pieces of how are we going to make sure that our congregants are really equipped to get the most out of this. I just I want to just make one other point just to kind of maybe alleviate some of Ira's concerns is that, you know, the synagogue's infrastructure is not really what's going to be handling this. Basically, from the, everything is going through Zoom. And so from Zoom's perspective, the synagogue is just one more participant on the, the Zoom call. And people regularly do calls with, you know, thousands and thousands, you know, thousand people on, on Zoom. Um, I mean, our, this is going to be big for us, but in terms of the, like, the usage of the platform and so on, it's, it's, it's not a particularly burdensome application. So, um, you know, and there are definitely, you know, there, there are mega churches or whatever that have services with, you know, thousands of people in them that are, you know, that, operate regularly. So there's, there's not, there's no more reason that it would go down on Rosh Hashanah than during a regular, you know, Shabbat service or now. And, and I, I, I would add just one, one more piece, which is that for people who are new within our synagogue, um, we will be um, preparing an instruction sheet um, and a video tutorial, and that will be available. Um, Jeanette Tellerman has a question. Uh, Lerman, Jeanette Lerman. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Hi. I, um, I wonder if you could tell us how long you anticipate the services will be. Um, sorry, I think I said that before you came on. Um, we're for the Rosh Hashanah morning service. We're looking at uh, two and a half to three hours, um, and we expect that the Yom Kippur morning service may run a little bit longer than that because Yom Kippur. Um, but we're really focused on trying to keep this within boundaries that will feel comfortable to participate in over Zoom, um, and of course, uh, having in mind people's attendance patterns. Um, when Sheila talks about the handbook that we're going to publish, um, that will also include approximations of when parts of the service will happen so that if people want to curate their worship experience by coming to the parts that matter most to them, uh, they'll have the information that they need to do that successfully. Thank you and congratulations to everyone who's worked so hard to think these things through. So oh, um, this is this is Sheila again, and um, I appreciate so much that you said that. Just listening to Rabbi Abe and um, Rabbi Yosef, um, to David Haas and Brian Wasserman, um, uh, give their presentations um, this 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 evening, and you know talk about what we've been doing. I I'm recalling just how much deliberation and brainstorming has 
has taken place to, to try to figure this out in the way that's best for everybody. And I personally am so grateful to every member of this group who has brought, you know, their individual ideas and wisdom and skills and just determination, hard work uh, to, uh, to this project. Um, as you probably have heard, uh, kind of uh, creating, strengthening the sense of community is, is one of the themes of, uh, that's run through everything that we've been doing. And um, a, a centerpiece of that effort is uh, the create, creation of a, a handbook uh, for the high holiday season. And we think this is especially important to, um, to help you know, guide people through at, at a time when they're, you know, they're on a journey where there they're are no, may not be any familiar markers or they may feel that there won't be any familiar markers. Uh, and we hope that the handbook will help us to feel connected uh, you know, at a time when you know, people would, might understandably feel kind of isolated and at sea. Uh, so when people have lots of questions, like how long is the service going to be? You know, when is Shacharit going to start? When is Yisker going to be? So all of that will be in the handbook, not only the schedule of services, but as Rabbi Abe said, uh, we'll break it down into components of the service. So you can decide when you want to, when you want to um, tune in. Um, you can know where we are um, when, when, um, when you do turn, tune in. And um, we'll have, uh, we'll also have a schedule and description of um, a number of other community activities um, uh, that will be offered both online and in person at like the chauffeur soundings. Uh, there'll be a schedule for, for those that will be in, in the handbook. Uh, and um, Brian um, mentioned uh, how strongly we feel about making sure to provide good instructions, both written and video, for the use of Zoom. And um, we'll give, th there will be um, people available who can, can coach you if, if you need a little bit of one-on-one -on -one support, one-on-one -on -one support uh, in using Zoom for services. Um, we'll, we'll also have things in the, in the handbook, like um, suggestions for how we might make the, the experience of High Holidays on Zoom more satisfying, um, not only by you know, feeling comfortable using Zoom, but um, perhaps some ideas for you know, how to create a space that, that feels like, um, like it's conducive to prayer, how to create our, our own you know, little sanctuaries in, in our homes, um, uh, our own you know, personal holy spaces. And the, um, the handbook will, will contain some, some materials to stimulate um, reflection on um, themes of the holidays. Other, we considered a number of other things and we're in the process of developing uh, the handbook now uh, and would certainly welcome any suggestions you have for, for other components of, of this, um, this guidebook. So any, any questions or, or comments on this aspect? of preparing for the holidays. Um, Sheila, I think we also have two questions that we may have missed from technology, uh, from Bonnie Nierman and Sherry Golden and Gottlieb. Um, so uh, we can take any questions about the handbook that Sheila just shared about, uh, but we should also, uh, we're gonna go to Bonnie. Uh, oh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. I wasn't quite sure how to do this. Um, perhaps you, I missed this, but if someone um, is in their home uh, trying to get on get onto the Zoom service and is having trouble connecting, and maybe I'm thinking about 
you know, just some person who's very unfamiliar with technology and panics a little bit, could there be, would it be possible to have a way to contact um, uh, someone uh, for help? No, we are, we, we are considering that, thinking about that. And uh, I think we also want to uh, suggest to everybody uh, to try this out before Rosh Hashanah. Um, and we certainly will have people available, you know, to, uh, for, for call, you know, to help um, at those times. Well, I guess I'm more, I'm more, I'm more worried about the, the actual, during the actual day of the services where someone, I could imagine them panicking and not being able to connect. Um, and uh, it, it could be helpful if, they, if there was a source to reach out to, to guide them. That's yeah, great. I think the, um, I, we'll need to talk about that, Bonnie. The complication uh, is around how we would manage that communication on Yom Tov itself. Right, of course. Right, because the halachic framework for these Zoom services is very tightly- Of course, yeah. Um, Anyway, so, so I think we I, we will take this back to the next task force meeting and talk through what the possibilities might be, um, and uh, you know, right for now, what we've really focused our attention on has been doing everything we can to make sure that people have uh, the experience and the instruction that they need to feel comfortable with it. Um, I think you know some of it is. Uh, uh, you know, D David uh, has been quite the miracle worker when it comes to this. Um, but, you know, if somebody's Wi-Fi goes out on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, that's really kind of beyond. Uh, unfortunately, there's a limit to what we're going to be able to help with. Um, so I think what we need to circle back on is to see to what extent can we provide any kind of day of support for people. Um, but I think that's going to be somewhat limited in what's really feasible. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Okay. Thank you. I mean, it may make sense also to be to have our to really. I, mean, I know this is going to just be super emphatic in our our instructions to people about getting getting it tested and feel you know really. Anyway, this this may be something to discuss offline, but you know, in terms of yeah. really, uh, I, we we will discuss this. Was there another tech question that we uh, missed? Harry Goldman Gottlieb had a question. Yeah, it wasn't uh, specifically a tech question. Um, I, first, thank you all for your work. I really appreciate it. Um, it's, I know, I, I, or I don't know, I can imagine how hard you've been working and how thorough, thoroughly you've approached this. So thanks everyone. Um, I'm, I'm just, um, I realize this is not everyone's concern or not quite to the same degree, but um, I know that Zoom does its noise canceling, ambient noise canceling to a better degree, depending on the device and the microphone. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to anticipate, especially if it's one's own device. And it would just be unfortunate if, I mean, I have no idea how great of a job it does with the microphone and it can be hard to know what it will be like with that particular configuration of people in the sanctuary and with the 10 other people spread out and the configuration on the bima and it would just be too bad if by whatever quirk of the combination of technology it just wasn't a great combination um so I don't know. It just seemed like that might be worth, maybe you have checked into that already, but it just seems oh, like that'd be too bad. If yeah, as David and Brian shared, uh, we're going to be doing extensive field testing between now and the high holidays, both um, kind of in small settings just to get the shots right, um, but also beginning um, toward the end of this month, I think not this Shabbos, but next Shabbos, uh, beginning to use the sanctuary cameras and audio for Shabbat morning services so that we'll have uh, some real world, real time experience with what it looks like, what it sounds like, um, with time to then make adjustments for the high holidays. Um, so I, I'm confident that we'll be able to iron out wrinkles before we get to Rosh Hashanah. Okay. 
yeah, just just to the degree that we could just be concerned with things like ambient noise and audio, at least I would really appreciate that. I, I know it's this is a learning curve for everyone, but it'd be nice. <laughs> yeah, and look, and we are, mm -hmm. um, I, I want to say, like, I'm, I feel really blessed and really proud of our staff and volunteers because um, I, I talk to all kinds of people and um, our team has done um, just a, a lot with um, really like making sure that we're on top of things and what's been uh, what's been at the top of the list always has been providing the highest quality possible experience. Um, and some of that about high quality experience are things like our Shabbat Kiddush, because that's part of people's experience. And part of the high quality experience question is, um, you know, the time that David puts in behind the scenes to make sure that people who are, you know, reading Haftarot and having other parts of service are positioned in such a way that we can see and hear them clearly. Um, and, you know, audio quality, video quality, connection strength, um, you know, we already had Wi-Fi in our building, um, and then David spent his summer getting wired connections <laughs> in so that the cameras would have a faster, more dependable internet connection in there. Um, because what, what we understand is that um, the, the best service is only as good as the quality of experience of the people who are participating. Yeah, what, what Sherry, Sherry's actually reached out to me previously about this issue, and um, there are situations, for example, during our weekday minyanim where people's phones go off, or you can hear the dog in the background, um, and there are also some situations where people aren't speaking directly into the microphone, and, and working with the clergy, we've been reaching out to people um, and providing some, some support, and in cases where we need to buy a microphone for somebody, we've been doing that. That's good to hear. Any questions or suggestions about the handbook? Is, is Sherry trying to respond to us? Is she, do you need to unmute her? Sorry, it's it's anyway you know what thank you i appreciate it okay. so it seems we're ready to move on to the next part of our um of our agenda and uh, we'll turn to rabbi annie to uh tell us about some of the the spiritual opportunities that will be available in addition to services from the sanctuary. How about Annie? Chodesh Tov, everyone. It is hard to believe that it is Rosh Chodesh Elul. We're in this month that is our spiritual runway into the High Holidays. So we've been talking a lot about um, what's going to happen on the day of. And I want to spend a little time about some opportunities we hope to, to create um, in this season, some spaciousness to, as um, Yosef mentioned at our High Holiday Tune-Up this past Wednesday night, to bring God into our pod um, during this, this year, which has been um, so difficult and full of challenges and changes for us um, individually, collectively, this month of Elul gives us an opportunity to pause, to reflect on how we've changed, um, and also to lift up our hopes for what we would like to see in the year that's coming. So um, one opportunity um, that Rabbi Eben and I are, are going to offer is that we would love to be available for spiritual check-ins with any of you who'd like to make time uh, for, for a meeting. Uh, we're here to listen, witness, support you, wherever you find yourself in this time. Um, and so we'll be scheduling these, these check-ins. Um, information will, will go out and um, we are excited to have that opportunity to, to connect with you. Um, and of course, that's something that all year round, we're here, we want to be available to you. And especially in this season, um, as you're thinking about the year that's passed and, and the year that's coming. Um, 
we know that uh, for so many of us, we're really missing being in our, our physical gorgeous um, sanctuary together. Um, and so we want to offer an opportunity um, for, for you and for those in your household to spend some time in private prayer in the sanctuary this season. Um, if you'd like to, to bring your tears and struggles and celebrations and dreams and songs and, and longings um, for yourselves, for your loved ones, for our world. And so, so we're going to offer that opportunity as well for you to schedule a visit during the month of Elul, during Aseret Yemei Tshuva, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, we have um, some exciting changes in our, our sanctuary, um, thanks to the work of of the building committee and, and our new executive director, Rebecca Slavin Phillips, and the generosity of Dr. Daniel Goldberg and Beverly Goldberg, you will find new carpeting in the sanctuary um, as well when, when you arrive. So the installation is happening now, and um, once that's complete, we'll begin scheduling um, visits for, for separate households to, to schedule time for, for private prayer in front of the ark and um, in the sanctuary space. Um, the past number of years for Slichot, the, the Saturday night uh, before Rosh Hashanah, we've had a, a musical contemplative service in partnership with Society Hill Synagogue in Lev Ha'ir. Um, Yosef and I have been working with Chazan Jesse Romer um, and with the cantorial soloist from Lev Ha'ir this year, Rina Branson, to, to create um, a musical experience, Slichot experience, that we'll do with, our, with Rabbi Eben the rabbis of those communities as well and we hope you'll you'll join us for that again a little spiritual launch pad into the high holidays an opportunity for for singing for meditation um, together um, earlier on in the meeting rabbi Abe mentioned Erev Rosh Hashanah which is going to look a little bit different this year so this year's Erev Rosh Hashanah we are going to be zooming from home um, we will offer the the Mariv Nusach and, um, and prayers. And then there's a custom uh, among those of Sephardic and, and Mizrahi origin to hold a Rosh Hashanah Seder using simanim, different symbols of food, and the way that we use apples and honey um, to bring about blessings for a sweet new year. There is a, a really beautiful ritual um, that involves using different, different foods, beets and leeks and other other foods um, to and puns uh, on the Hebrew words to, to bring about blessings for the year ahead. So we're going to be leading a short Rosh Hashanah Seder as well at the end of, um, of the meal. So we'll send out information about that as well if you'd like to get some of the, the simanim, some of the fun food items that we'll use. So that'll be an opportunity to do something a little bit different um, this year as a community um, or, or on your own in your household. Um, you'll have that information. Um, Rabbi Abe mentioned Tashlich as well, and that that will be something that um, folks um, are, are encouraged to go, you know, on, on your own or, or with your household or, or pod, uh, but we will be providing some resources and materials for you uh, for a traditional Tashlich service. And it's something that can be done, you know, on the, the second day of Rosh Hashanah this year, that's not Shabbat, or any time, really, in, in Aseret Yemei Tshuva. Um, and... Um, ah, right, I think just what, one thing I want to go back and, and reiterate about the sanctuary appointments um, to, to the, coming into the sanctuary and into the building, that that will be by appointment only. So everyone will have an opportunity to, to schedule an appointment if you like, but at the moment, um, in order to keep our, our building, our staff, our students and one another as safe as possible um, in this time of COVID, all uh, visits to the building are, are by appointment only, and, and those sanctuary visits will be um, by, by prior appointment. So we will give you information about that. Um, and the last thing I want to, to cover is a question that's come up at, at previous town halls um, in terms of providing opportunities for the whole range of our community to connect to the meaning of these days. And um, Rabbi Max has been working to organize youth and family services. And so information about those opportunities will, will go out um, to our families. So I'm gonna pause here for some questions um, about anything I mentioned, spiritual check-ins, sanctuary visits, 
uh, Tashlich, Zoom from Home, Erev Rosh Hashanah and Rosh Hashanah Seder. Um, let's see. Oh, we have a question from Rena Field. As always, how do you get an appointment? Uh, when we're when we're ready to schedule them. So right now we're still waiting for the sanctuary carpet installation to finish. When we're ready to schedule those appointments, the ECOM, the weekly email, will have detailed information about how you request uh, and what the time slots are going to look like uh, and so on. Um, right. so there'll be information going out to the community with full details about how to sign up for all of that. Fabulous. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? Okay, thank you all so much for, for being here. I'm going to turn it back over to Sheila. So thank you, Rabbi Annie. So much exciting to look forward to. And we'll turn now to um, Ivy Weingram, who's going to tell us about some um, special opportunities uh, for community part participation um, and services. Ivy is, has been a part of our community participation small group team, working team. Thanks, Sheila. Um, so it's wonderful to see you all. I, um, I have the pleasure of uh, relaying some of the ways in which you all can um, hopefully choose to be a part of our high holiday services so that these aren't just you know, one-way experiences coming from the Bima through Zoom to your home, but ways in which you can contribute your own thoughts and creativity to bringing in the new year as a community. Um, and so uh, one of them you've seen, um, one of these uh, uh, community participation uh, opportunities you've seen in the econ uh, for the past several weeks, and um, it was in there again today, so please check it out. We would love to, um, be able to share your written um, reflections on the past year with our congregation, with our community. And we've given uh, a prompt or an idea to get you thinking. It's called Lost and Found. Uh, so take some time to think about what you've lost this year, a tumultuous time, um, and what you found. So that might be, um, uh, you know, these can all be literal or figurative answers. Maybe you've picked up and you've discovered a new skill and picked up a new hobby. Maybe you've discovered something new about your home <laughs> or your neighborhood um, that you've fallen in love with. And we'd love for you to share those ideas with our community. You can, um, uh, we're requesting submissions of 300 words or less, which is not very much. Um, you can submit them um, and not to be shared anonymously, so we won't share it with your name, but all the responses that we receive will be compiled. Some, uh, we might ask you to, if you don't, if you don't mind um, not being anonymous, we might ask you to read them for the congregation um, at some point during the service over the holidays, and um, they'll all otherwise be available um, in written form. So I really hope that you all participate in that. Uh, take some time, think about it, and um, send in uh, the, the, they're going to be sent to our congregant, Sabrina Rubin Erdeli, and her email and a link to her email was in the econ that came out today. So take a look for that. Um, there are um, two other creative ways that we'd love to um, have you be a part of our high holiday services. You will be receiving, not, not sure exactly how it'll be distributed yet, but you'll be receiving the template of the BZBI logo, the Hamsa logo. And you'll be invited as an individual or you and maybe your partner or as a family to, um, to uh, decorate this hamsa to represent you in our congregation, in our sanctuary in which most of us will not be experiencing the holidays. So you'll get a, a paper template and you'll be invited to you know, put your name, a portrait of you or a, or a picture of your family. That can be a photograph, you can draw it. Um, whatever feels comfortable to you. If each person in the family wants to do their own, that's wonderful. And we'll have a way for you to return them to the shul and they'll be um, posted throughout the, um, throughout the sanctuary to sort of populate 
our, our Bay Knesset with your, uh, you know, some, some personal tokens to represent your, you and your family as, as part of the sanctuary. Uh, and they'll also maybe pop up on screen from time to time during the course of the services. So look out for this Hamsa coming your way that we hope that you'll um, have fun uh, creating a piece of yourself to share with us um, in time for the holidays. And the last thing um, you should look out for also is an opportunity to participate with your voice. Um, we're planning to do, to create sort of a virtual choir singing Adon Olam. And um, you'll, you'll receive detailed instructions for how to record yourself singing Adon Olam and how to send in that video to our congregation where it will be spliced together with the voices of many others in our community. And um, hopefully this will be a, a really fun, wonderful representation of, um, of our community. Uh, you've probably seen this kind of thing going around online, you know, virtual choirs and the cast of Hamilton. I'm not saying any of them are gonna drop into our Adon Alam virtual choir, but um, we're gonna do just as, just as well. Um, so uh, I really hope, it doesn't matter if you have a good voice or you don't like your voice, you're going to be spliced together with, with lots of other people from our community. So um, we, we would love to have you and your, your children and your grandchildren all submit videos of yourselves to this Adon Alam project. So those are probably the three, um, the three ways that as a community we can have the, you know, the greatest impact, um, strengthen numbers, the more people who contribute, um, I think the It'll, it'll really enrich the quality of our services and, um, and our new year. Ivy, thank you for your work on these projects and thank you for making us smile. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Abe. Um, are, there, are there any questions about anything that Ivy shared before I go on? So we're, we're here on Rosh Chodesh Elul, um, and we will be together on Zoom again when the moon cycles this way, right? Um, we have, I can't, you can't see it from here, but in our kitchen, um, we have this lovely uh, woodcut board that shows the moon phases with a little peg that we move every few days to mark. Um, and as I was looking at it today on the new moon peg, I was really conscious of um, that the next time the peg goes in that slot, um, it will be go time for this Rosh Hashanah that is unlike any in the history of the Jewish people. Um, and that feels, that feels scary, right? Um, because we're all headed into uncharted waters. Um, you know, and particularly for Rabbi Annie and I, and for the other leaders who are taking part for the High Holiday Task Force, uh, who have had the courage to shoulder this responsibility of guiding this congregation uh, through something that there's no playbook for. Um, and I'm filled with, I'm filled with gratitude um, because for the 12 of us to have done this work over the summer is one thing, but for so many of our community members to have come out tonight uh, to hear all of this and to share your thoughts, um, I, I, I feel the support from our community broadly. Um, and that matters so much um, because this is what BZBI is. This is the strength of BZBI. Um, and even a crazy pandemic can't hold us down. And, you know, this, the moon is going to grow over the next 29 days and the light is going to shine and it's going to change and we're going to change and we're going to be back on this Zoom. Uh, some of us will be in the sanctuary a month from now to watch all of these plans and all of these ideas turn into a celebration. 
And I feel so blessed to celebrate with all of you and with the other 300 something screens that aren't here tonight. Um, I, I can't honestly believe that we're actually gonna go ahead and do this, but I think it's gonna be great. Um, and I think, you know, this is just gonna be one of these things that we're gonna say, we did it and we thrived in it. And we kept, you know, everything was different. And the, the beating heart of this congregation, the love and connection that we have for one another, that wasn't different, right? That came through. That carried us through however long this thing goes on. Um, and we learned how to be BZBI when the world changed. Um, and, and, and that's each of you um, bears a piece of my gratitude for making that possible. So thank you all. We're done, everybody can get some ice cream and go to bed. Or go to Minion. Oh, right. Yes. Thank you. I, I can't see the clock from here. Minions in eight minutes would be super helpful if at least uh, 10 people could be there. Shana Tovah.